It's a beautiful afternoon here in Ozark County. Hi, I'm Jim V. Brock. I've spent the last 30 years out photographing, documenting, and now videoing old water mills. This is Hodson's Mill. Let's take a look around. This is a really cool site and I want to share some things about it with you. What I think is unique about this site is that it's very different from most of the mills we go to. Most of the mills we go to are powered by a reservoir of water where we have dammed up the creek or river using a mill dam to create a mill pond. In this case, there's neither one of those. This mill has been powered for a century now by using the cave spring that comes out of the mountain underneath the mill. We talk so much about sustainable energy today. We talk about solar energy and we talk about wind energy, but the permitting process to get additional hydroelectric energy is nearly impossible. And that's a shame because it is such a great natural resource and it has been powering this mill for over a hundred years. Let's talk about the different propulsion systems of a mill like this. Behind me, this white wheel is really just here for show. And I think what they were trying to mimic here was an undershot wheel, which might have worked okay because this mill operates off of a spring. In most cases with a wheel this size, you will see some kind of a race or chase or sluice coming to the top of it, coming to the, just past the top dead center. The water would then cascade into the troughs of the front of the wheel using gravity and inertia to turn the wheel and power the mill. If the sluice came to just before the top dead center, the wheel would return backwards and that would be called a pitch back wheel. In this case, the spring is coming out of the side of the mountain here and has got this uh, waterway or this race coming here and it's supposed to turn this mill. Now, it would be working in a counterclockwise direction behind me here. There's just simply not enough flow here to turn this wheel, even though I think it's probably been years since this wheel actually turned. So that's the three types of wheels you might have had, but this mill actually operates off of two turbines. There's a relatively small turbine down in the pit, and then there's one of the bigger turbines I've ever seen down in there as well. The turbines are really kind of cool. They have a little one over here in the side yard, so let's go take a look at it. talk about the turbine here for just a minute. This mill actually is operating off of two turbines. One of them is about this size. The other one is a very large one. It's one of the bigger ones I've seen. It's probably 48 inches across. So let's talk about how these work. These are really cool because they work off a of static water pressure. They're in a pit and the deeper the pit is, the more horsepower you can get out of the turbine because of the weight of the water. The deeper the water these are sitting in, the more horsepower they will have. Inside of this apparatus is an impeller. When the mill is off, these fins are closed. When, to turn it on, there is a wheel up inside the mill that is attached to that gear over there. When you open it, these fins open, allowing the water to race in there and turn an impeller that is on the inside of this. I think that is really cool. The impeller, when it's turning, turns this shaft, which goes up into the mill and ultimately runs the pulley system powering the mill. What's really cool about these to me is that this is 1800s technology. These came about about 1860 or later. And the cool thing about it for me is that your computer you're watching today, the TV you're watching right now, is partially powered by a hydroelectric dam. That hydroelectric dam today is using a turbine very similar to this to generate the electricity. So your home today is being powered by 1800s technology. I think that's really cool. Let's talk about the person who operates the mill for a moment. That person would be called a millwright. Sometimes they're called a miller for slang. 
So that person would make money in a pretty ingenious way. The farmer would bring their crop to town, and in many cases, the farmer would share that crop with the millwright. Sometimes they would just pay for the services outright, but in most cases, the millwright wanted part of that crop. The reason they wanted part of that crop is so that they could sell it to the town folk nearby, and they would need product that they could sell year-round. So as a benefit to the farmer, they would oftentimes mill the product for free in exchange for part of the harvest. This worked out very good for the farmer, worked out very good for the miller as well. It's not uncommon for small communities to pop up around these mills, and it makes perfect sense because when the farmer would bring his crop to the mill to be processed, they did other things. They would get their hair cut, they would go to the general store, and they would get provisions that they need. Now, they didn't come to town like you and I do every day. They would only come a couple of times of the year. So the entire family came, and it was a big outing. A lot of times, they would go to church. They would have ice cream socials. The mill was the center point of attention for these small communities. When the mill was doing good, these communities would thrive. When the mill was doing poorly, these communities would dry up. But it's not uncommon to find small buildings like this to be a general store in close proximity to the mill. Let's talk about how the mill operated. What that would happen was the farmer bring the dry ears of corn in. So it's going to be pretty late in the season. The kernels are still on the cob. So the first thing they would need to do is get those kernels off of the cob. They run it through a machine called a corn sheller. This is a unique machine. A mill of this size probably had one hooked up to the central belt pulley, but they could have had the hand crank type. And you can still find these around at farm sales. Um, and they're pretty cool. If you get a chance to pick one up, do so. In that case, you would have put the dried ear of corn in the top, you turn the crank, and the kernels fall out the bottom and the cob comes out the side. And in that case, it was a very efficient way of getting the kernels off of the cob. From there, you would have ran it through some kind of a screener and or a seed separator. And what that machine did is it cleaned the kernels. It blew the chafe off and all the other debris and separated the kernels down according to size. Now, from there, you would have picked one of three different basic types of grinders. The earliest forms of the grinders were stone mills. These were really cool. They took a, st a round stone that had two sides, two halves, and they were very close together. The corn kernel would drop in between them, and they would then roll opposing, and that would grind them down to whatever consistency you wanted. After about the turn of the 1900s, they moved to a burr mill, and a burr mill it runs with um, a couple of uh, steel plates against each other, and that worked very efficiently as well. The more common ones you'll see in the bigger mills are roller mills. These are big machines, and they would have had roll, big steel rollers in them, and they work opposing of each other and would have crushed that seed corn down to whatever uh, consistency you wanted. From there, it's going to go through some kind of a separator again to separate out the different consistencies, whether you wanted corn meal or you wanted chicken scratch or, some, or Midlands or something like that, or grits even, something along those lines. They would be separated after it was all ground. Sometimes they had to grind the corn more than once to get down to the consistency they were looking for. One of the things I love about coming to video these mills is the picturesque location that they're at. These are some of the most beautiful sites in the entire country. But with that comes a problem for the mills. There's two primary ways that these mills are no longer in existence. And to find one that's in its original condition, that is still usable and in good operating condition, is a very rare find. This mill's been here for quite some time, but it has been no stranger to high water events. As a matter of fact, there's five marks right here on the doorpost of how high the water's been up on this mill. Now the platform that I'm standing on is a good 14 feet from the ground level. And yet, this is the high water mark. So you can tell there's been a lot of water come down through this valley. 
What happens to these mills is that because they're exposed, most of them's foundation is right next to the main channel due to the mill dam. What happens is debris will pound on these mills as the high water mark comes. And if you're in an unfortunate situation to have high, fast moving water, then the debris can absolutely destroy the mill. Think about it, a full size tree weighing a ton or more can float and that becomes a very powerful battering ram to tear down these mills. This one fortunately is nestled back in and amongst a cliff away from the main water channel which is about a quarter of a mile from here. Remember this mill is powered by a spring so high water that gets here is slow moving. That's why this mill has been able to survive. Now another way that these mills, particularly in southern Missouri and northern Arkansas, were destroyed was due to the Civil War. It was an unfortunate event that happens when one side or the other is retreating from a, an area. The mill being the economic center makes it a target. The retreating side would burn the mill to keep it from falling into the hands of the invading side. This happened to lots of mills all through southern Missouri and northern Arkansas. So this mill survived that as well. But there's another element of fire that plagues these mills. Corn in its dry state is flammable. And many of your modern day pellet stoves run off of corn kernels. So imagine what's happening inside this mill when they're grinding corn. You have not only bags and bags and bags, hundreds of bags, of either corn kernels or processed corn in the way of corn meal or grits, something along those lines, sitting in this mill that is flammable. You also have, during the process of grinding the corn, the dust is in the air and the dust is explosive. So it was not uncommon for a mill like this to have a flash fire and then immediately ignite and burn just like the tip of a match. Mm -hmm. I hope you've enjoyed our time at Hodgson's Mill. I'm Jim Vibrock. Let's go find another mill to explore.